Hello one, hello all, welcome to this final episode of 1999, best movie year ever. This is it, December 1999, and then, and then we all part and go our separate ways. <laughs> now, so if you've watched the November episode, you realize that I was a little short on the guests, and the main reason for that is we're a little heavy this month for a guest. We're not basing this by time or time of release. I'm just gonna rapid fire you all the guest spots in this episode, and I will meet you on the other end to discuss what's left over and my big story from December, 1999. So anywho, let's take it away. Hey folks, how you doing? Dave McRae here. The Green Mile. Let's talk about The Green Mile, released on December the 6th, 1999. I was 20 years old in 1999. This is one of my favorite films of all time, period. Like I'm talking probably absolutely in top 10, maybe even top five. I'm not, I'm not fucking joking around. You know, when I think of The Green Mile, there's something that I think about. There's one thing, well, there's a lot of things I think about, but one of the things I think about is sort of the, the era of movies that it came out in, where I was at that time. And as a 20 year old, you know, kid for all intents and purposes, I was really starting to appreciate uh, drama at that time. Now, I'm not talking about the kind you experience in high school. I'm talking about the genre, the genre. I was really starting to appreciate it. I always appreciate it, but you know, you're a kid, you know, you're into horror and slashers and action and all that kind of stuff. But I was really starting to appreciate drama. And I think it, it started for me probably several years earlier when I saw Forrest Gump. Now, I never saw Forrest Gump in the movie theater. I actually caught it uh, several months later, maybe even in 1995 on the movie network or something. And I think Forrest Gump was the first movie I ever saw that gave me a real lump in my throat where I really experienced that sensation from watching a movie. And uh, there's a lot of moments in that movie that can do that for you, but I believe it was, spoiler alert, but hey, if you haven't seen it, you're in no rush now. Um, it was when Jenny died and Forrest Gump is, you know, really kind of breaking down and he's, as he's talking to the love of his life uh, at her grave. And uh, I remember feeling that basketball in my throat going, oh man, this is really, oh my crap, you know, keep it together, keep it together. Well, the same thing happened to me watching The Green Mile. And I did see The Green Mile in the movie theater when it came out. And this movie is, what is there to say about this movie that really hasn't already been said? But it is a terrific, it's a three hour film, so it's long, but it is a terrific drama. It's directed by Frank Darabont, the same guy who directed The Shawshank Redemption. Now, Frank Darabont is a terrific director. Everything he's touched in terms of feature films has been really good. You have The Shawshank Redemption from 1994, which is arguably one of the greatest, if not, and I say this arguably, if not the greatest movie ever made. Uh, you have the Green Mile from 1999. Then you have The Majestic, which is a bit of a different kind of film. And then you have The Mist, another Stephen King adaptation from 2007, I believe. And I think, I stand to be corrected, but I believe that's the last major feature film that he's directed. I think he spent most of his time since in television. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, that's that's amazing. That's awesome. And maybe that's what he wants to do. Maybe he has no no you know uh, uh, no interest in continuing in continuing to make feature films like that. Um, but man, do I think he's talented. And I and I wish he would make more. When I think of the Green Mile, I mean, yeah, I do. I think about Tom Hanks and I think about the late Michael Clark Duncan and the amazing performances and the story and how you know he was this incredible, almost not a deity, but a, but a, like just a magical, it was real. His powers were real. Uh, and I was like, holy shit. And he could really help heal people. And he really was innocent. Oh my God, he was innocent. He was innocent. Holy shit. But they still had to go through with it. Oh my God, the pain, the, all that, you know, you think about all that. But I think about how that was the first experience I ever had in a movie theater where I got the lump in my throat. And I remember sitting there thinking, keep it together, keep it together. Oh my God, keep it together. And the, the, you know, it went from like a little like marble to, you know, the size of a, of, a, of a small tangerine to like a grapefruit. And it's just like, keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. You know, not that there's anything wrong with crying during a movie, but you know, you, 
maybe it's a guy thing, I don't know. Maybe women are more likely to kind of let go and be vulnerable in that way. And some men will do it too, of course. But I just remember thinking, oh, I don't want to start sobbing all over the place. You know what I mean? I don't want to come out of the theater going, <laughs> <laughs> which I could easily have done because it was fucking amazing. And uh, so I just remember thinking, keep it together, keep it together. But that was, I think, I think that was my real first experience in a movie theater feeling that sensation. Because again, I'd felt it several years earlier with Forrest Gump, but that was at home. That was in the comfort of my own home. And I still didn't cry then, but you know, you're on the verge, you know? Um, what a terrific film. And one of my favorite movie soundtracks to this day. Hands down. When I was a kid, I was you know, I was into certain bands. I, I can't say that. I mean, I've always liked ACDC, but I was really into. I liked music. I was I was into I didn't you know certain pop music, top forty rock music, things like that. But I was a I, I, I'm a movie guy, so I was really into movie soundtracks. And the Green Mile to this day, to this day. I'm nearly 43 years old. To this day, it is one of my favorite movie soundtracks of all time. The instrumental music in The Green Mile is haunting and eerie and mystical, which makes sense, look at the movie. It's just tremendous. I love it to this day. It's an incredible soundtrack. If you haven't listened to the music isolated on its own outside of The Green Mile, and the amazing character performances, like from the great Sam Rockwell. Oh, terrific character actor. And if you wanna watch a movie, I know this is all about The Green Mile, but I gotta say this. If you wanna watch a terrific independent film starring Sam Rockwell as the lead, and I think he's the only guy in it, uh, is the, uh, I think it's from 2009. It's a little independent film called Moon. Moon, great film starring Sam Rockwell. He was also the lead in the remake to Poltergeist, but. So, yeah, you know, I, I think about that, right? And I think about the other characters, like each, you know, person that was on death row, each person that was, you know, about to walk the green mile were such strong character actors. And um, everybody, everybody was, was amazing in that film from top to bottom. It was so well cast. The performances were fantastic. If you have not seen The Green Mile and you really liked, say, The Mist or The Shawshank Redemption, and you just, for whatever reason, just have never seen The Green Mile, do yourself a favor, sit down and watch The Green Mile. Now it's a three hour film, so be prepared. You know, grab some snacks, make sure you've emptied your bladder, but it's a fantastic film. To this day, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, period. It would be on, uh, at the very minimum, it would be on a top 10 list for sure. And probably, depending on the day and how I'm feeling, break into my top five hands down. Uh, I adore this film. I adore this film. And anytime, it's the kind of movie that um, if it's on television, for those of you that still have cable, and you see it and it's playing on TV, it's the kind of movie that you got to watch a bit of it. And then you find yourself that your intention is like, well, I'm only going to watch like five minutes because, you know, I got things I got to do. And that five minutes turns into 10 minutes and that 10 minutes turns into half an hour. And that half an hour, depending on when you tune in, where, you know, wherever the movie is, when you tune in, you end up watching the whole fucking thing because it's amazing. And the last thing I will say on the Green Mile is this. One of my favorite lines, there's a lot of great lines. Oh my God, there's so many great lines. But one of the great lines is, is uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but is how the movie ends. And it ends on a line, of course, as, as the, the older, the older um, um, uh, Tom Hanks, character because now it fast forwards from back in the 30s now to um uh to present day 1999 i guess uh and of course it's not tom hanks in makeup it's actually an older actor and um and but he takes his girlfriend off to see mr jangles the mouse right the cute little mouse and and she's like paul is that is that really him i mean how can that be him you were telling me a story from like the 30s how could that still be the same mouse and uh, because of the powers from uh, John Coffey, right? I'm 108 years old, Elaine. I was 44 the year that John Coffey walked the Green Mile. Oh, I've lived to see some amazing things, Ellie. I've had to see my friends and loved ones die off through the years. 
Al and Melinda, you will die too. And my curse is knowing that I'll be there to see it. Certainly from a philosophical point of view as well is, you know, I think we would all love, you know, we would all like, nobody wants to die, right? Nobody wants to die. We would all love to live forever. But the real question is not, do you want to live forever? The real question is, you know, what's the quality of life going to be if I could? And do my friends and family and everybody I love and adore get to live forever with me? Because if I get to live forever, but I'm bound to a bed, what's the point, right? It's about quality of life. And number two, if I get to live forever, but everybody else around me get, you know, has to die, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a real philosophical sort of discussion there. And, and I found that kind of a... Uh, a theme a little bit, certainly hammered home towards um, the end of the film. But anyway, I could go on and on and on, but this is one of my favorite movies of all time, period. You've got to watch The Green Mile, a terrific drama. Um, and it, it feels so grounded and real too. And then there's this little supernatural element to it, which is kind of fun. And it doesn't, it doesn't overshadow the, the grounded reality that the film, uh, takes place in and feels real. It's not a fantastical movie. It just has that little hint of that supernatural, fantastical element in regards to John Coffey, but it's so beautifully done and so nuanced and so understated at times that you buy it. You believe it. You have no trouble believing it. Um, so yeah, anyways, I could go on and on. Uh, thanks to, uh, CP for, um, allowing me to do this. This has been awesome. And, uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate it, man. And, uh, this series that you're doing has been really cool. So, um, Hey, again, if you haven't seen the green mile, you've got to watch the green mile. Do it. My name is Dave McRae. In the meantime, and in between time. What's up guys, Jace here, or Moon Man Jace, as some of you guys might know me. Today, really honored to be part of my good friend CP's film, 99 series that he's been doing over the past year. This is December, and I picked a very underrated and much loved movie for myself, The Talent of Mr. Ripley, starring Matt Damon, directed by Anthony Megalia. This is more of a bargain bin situation, personal antidote. Where back in the day, 212, 213, BW, which is an Australian store, kind of like a Walmart for you guys in the, in the US, Anyway, rummaging for a DVD bin. Yeah, that's right, a DVD bin. Uh, for all you millennials out there, I'll let you know what a DVD is later on. Anyway, rummaging through, found Taylor Mr. Ripley for five bucks. Blind buy, why not? That's all I was doing back in the days. Most of you guys can probably relate to, just blind buy after blind buy, not really watching anything. So first up guys, we have Black Girl. Never seen this movie, I heard it's actually pretty good. Look at that, I like that artwork right there. That is blood simple, also really love that artwork. I like that artwork as well. Really beautiful artwork right there. Should I forget how many movies are in here? Uh, one, two, three, yeah, we, here yeah, look at this. See that artwork? Awesome, gorgeous. Really, really nice, love the color. Owned by Francis Ford Coppola. Guys, the, I haven't seen this one, but you gotta understand, the reason I'm super excited for this is it's the same director as Outsiders. What? <laughs> what an idiot! Oh! I finally watched it, I think it was about late teens, early 20s, probably the perfect age to watch this movie. When you get to that age group, you kind of watch more movies, more dialogue driven movies, more dramas, things like that. More mature age movies, that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, loved it. Film pretty much centered around the main theme. Why be a real nobody when you can be a fake somebody? And that's very relevant to today because that's most of what we do in life um, when we're either doing jobs, social media, YouTube, for example. We're all putting on these characters and personas to impress people. It's like the great, great line from Fight Club, which is another 99 film. We buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like, and that's really relevant to this film as well, because that's all kind of what Matt Damon does throughout the film. Such a great cast. You've got uh, Jude Law, Kate Blanchett, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Gwyneth Paltrow, and throughout the film, that's all he's trying to do with all these characters, impress them, uh, trying to be this person because he's really just a nobody. He's got a dead-end job, really going nowhere in life, and just more of a leech uh, in a way. So. 
yeah, my advice to you though, guys, uh, aside from this film, is just be yourself. That's what I got out of it. Uh, don't try and impress people. Don't put on these fake somebodies because eventually it's going to catch up with you. So be yourself. Be who you really are, and the real people will appreciate you. That's all I've got to say for that. Take care, guys. Hello there, welcome to CP's 1999, the best year in film, apparently. It is pretty hard to dispute. I mean, there's, there's at least three movies from 1999 that sit in my top 20, possibly more, but three that I can remember. So it's a damn good year. Today he's, he's asked me to come on and talk about my favorite movie from 1999. And it is one of my top five movies ever made which is, of course, Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. Given the scope of the film, given how big it is, it's a three hour dramatic epic in which frogs fall from the sky, spoiler alert. Yeah, it, it gets crazy in places, it really does, but it, it is a tapestry of life. It's one of those movies that many different characters who have their own individual stories and then at brief, intersections they will you know they will cross i'm a sucker for that kind of movie you know you think uh shortcuts by robert altman there's quite a few robert altman films actually that kind of take that that tack there's a lot of inspiration i think from shortcuts in this though paul thomas anderson would say he was more inspired by the likes of jonathan demi with particularly how how he directs for me it's the simple message that lies at the heart of it that is we need to treat each other better. It's, it's a film about broken people and the simple fact that we need to treat each other better. It's got one of my favourite endings of all time, which is this one final kind of zooming in shot on Melora Walters. She, so her character is this really broken woman. If, if you're not paying attention, if because it, it's a really long shot, uh, and you can't quite hear what this other character is saying. And if you're not paying attention, you'll miss the very final moment. And the, the, literally the last second of the film, she, she breaks the fourth wall and she smiles. And it's just, without saying anything, it tells you everything, which is basically that, that she's gonna be okay. Uh, and it, it's just such an uplifting ending and it always gets to me. Uh, and it's just, it's just perfect. This film has one of my favorite characters created for a film of all time as well, which is John C. Riley's police officer, Officer Curran, Jim Curran. Now, I don't know if Paul Thomas Anderson has any kind of faith, any kind of religious belief or whatever, um, but certainly from the perspective of, of someone who does, this guy is unbelievably well written. I'm so used to seeing Christian characters in movies that kind of sit in one or two camps. Either they are the religious nut job who judges everyone and uh, yeah, rather harshly and, and yeah, puts themselves on a pedestal and, and just very harsh characters. Or they are the Ned Flanders, you know, wearing a sweater, blue sweater and, and just coming off kind of lame. Uh, yeah, just, but this guy feels very real to me. He feels, I can identify with him. This, this is the thing, he's, he's a Christian guy, He's just trying to live by faith. He's a police officer, so he has to deal with some of the worst that life has to, to throw at, at, at anyone, quite frankly. But he lets his faith lead him. And he doesn't make, it doesn't make him perfect. He, you know, he makes mistakes. There's one particular point in the film when he loses his gun, which, you know, if you're a police officer, that's, that's a no-no. You don't do that. You become the laughing stock of your of your team, of your station. So along the way, he meets this woman, Laura Walters' character, who's, like I say, she's a mess, she's broken, but he doesn't judge her. He falls in love with her. And it's just, it's a beautiful love story. And it's something that um, Anderson has done pretty well several times in his career. He's, I, I think he's a bit of a romantic at heart. Yeah, like punch drunk love. It's, he's very good at taking these quirky, funny, broken characters and making you root for them and, and delivering a love story that you can really identify with and connect with and that's here. Now it follows a lot of different characters which means there's a lot of room there for bringing in big hitters, big guns you know, like Julianne Moore, Tom Cruise, Philip Seymour Hoffman who is my 
my favorite actor of all time. Uh, but yeah, Tom Cruise in particular is fantastic in this movie as Frank T.J. Mackey. He plays this man who's all bravado. He runs these seminars about how to tame women, uh, which you know, right there should tell you something about him. Uh, but slowly and surely across the course of the movie, we see the layers of this, this facade being broken down, being peeled away to reveal what is essentially just this hurt, scared little boy underneath. And the way that Anderson does that, you know, the, the way he peels those layers off is so brilliantly done. It's, and it just, it turns what is a wretched, despicable character at the start of the film into someone that you just sympathise with by the end and, and feel for. And, and like I say, it, it really speaks into what is the message at the heart of the film, which is that we need to treat each other better. Because when we don't, you end up with your Frank T.J. Mackies of the world, you know? Like, pe people don't just become a villain overnight. Uh, you know, if you treat people like crap, they become crap. Um, and, and ultimately, that's, that's why I love the movie. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple interpretations that you could have for that ending, but there is no doubt it certainly speaks to the biblical. Um, and I think ultimately it's about the fact that we are all connected. All these people going through their struggles, different struggles, are suddenly connected in one moment by this strange, miraculous, bizarre thing that is happening. We're all on the same planet, we're all here together, we're stuck with each other whether we like it or not. So let's try and uh, to try and make life better by treating each other the way we wish to be treated. Uh, ultimately, that, that's it really. Like, I, I can't recommend this film enough. I love it. It, 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 is, it is a tough watch. Like I say, it's three hours and it's quite heavy drama. Uh, you know, every, everyone's got a story, everyone's hurting, everyone's got brokenness. Um, but just from the perspective of high class filmmaking, a filmmaker at the top of his game when you know he's coming off the back of boogie nights he's got the whole the world is his oyster so to speak in filmmaking terms and he just comes out all guns blazing this is an absolute masterpiece it's one of my favorite movies of all time as i say it's in my top five um watch it do yourself a favor if you've not seen it watch it for the love of all that is holy, watch it. Best film of 1999, as far as I'm concerned. Whether or, whether or not 1999 is the best year in, in cinema, I will leave for you to decide. But uh, yeah, definitely from my perspective, it is a contender. But there you go, that's my bit, all done and dusted. Thank you, CP, once again for having me on. Always a pleasure, mate. Uh, and yeah, see you on the flip side, whatever. Thank you so, so much to Dave McRae, Brian Lomax, and Jace, all of YouTube fame. Uh, your stories are, are rather heartfelt. I don't know if I'm gonna come close to that here, but we have a couple movies left over before we, we shut this thing down for good and turn the lights out on this little project known as 1999. December 1999 also gave us the Tim Allen film Galaxy Quest with Alan Rickman and Sigourney Weaver, which was about Star Trek-ish people who are doing the Comic-Con circuit, living on their history's past, and somehow an, an alien entity picks up on their old transmissions, which just happens to be TV shows, and they're actually in trouble, and, and aliens are actually needing their help. Uh, shout out to Sam Rockwell, who actually was a red shirt. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know what that means. I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm just crewman number six. I'm expendable. I'm the guy in the episode who dies to prove the situation is serious. I gotta get out of here. But no, Galaxy Quest was quite a good time. And again, I, I wasn't much of a Star Trek fan, although I was a big time Star Wars fan. It's funny that something like Phantom Menace and Galaxy Quest came out in the same year. And, you know, they covered a little bit opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, one was quite funny and one, one was released. Another film that gets quoted quite a bit between jocks and sport heads all over the place was Oliver Stone's Any Given Sunday with Jamie Foxx and Al Pacino. Lawrence Taylor, I think, even had a part in this. Oh, oh, 
Uh -huh. Stop. Oh, just stop them cold, goddamn it. Uh -huh. Stop. Of course not. This is a movie that it is not your grandfather's football movie. Oh, you're fucking not. I need some Vicodin. I need some cyclobenzaprine. I need some stuff on your nose. It was a nice change of pace. Uh, I don't know if I would call it something along the lines of uh, win one for the Gipper. It was pretty straightforward. It, and I don't get the ball, I don't get my stats, I don't get my money. And I like getting my money, coach. It, it's unfortunate to realize how much negative stuff, drugs, things like that lead our culture, even in situations where our kids look up to those people. But Oliver Stone knows what he's doing. Uh, if you thought Platoon was gonna be a, a nice soft ride, you're, you're, you're in for a bad day. And any given Sunday is, is to football playing as Platoon is to war, nice and friendly. But lastly, but not leastly, and this will be my final story, the icing on the cake as far as why 1999 was, was such a big deal to me. And uh, it kind of is the, the, the landmark in my life. In December, I was getting closer and closer to wanting to do stand-up comedy, and I had had confidence by then. People I was hanging out with, they, they made me feel like you know, it wasn't this completely lopsided idea. Me and a friend of mine back from Queens, we kind of had this deal that uh, once Madeline Kahn, actress from Blazing Saddles, actress from Clue, had passed on, which she had recently just passed on in early December, that I would at least try it. And sure enough, here comes this movie with Jim Carrey as Andy Kaufman, It's an out there movie where, where he gets started in stand up. And the thing that that just completely sucked me in was the fact that he was he was doing stand up and he wasn't he wasn't going for laughs. He, he was doing things, but he didn't like his laughter wasn't about what the audience was laughing at. And I and I found that so odd, uh, something that that I mean, most comedians will tell you that the things that they get off on are the fact that you're, you're getting this huge response from the audience, um, not Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman really, really seemed to dig the idea that people were confused. They didn't understand what was happening. And he thought that was funny. And to, to watch this movie that, that fairly replicates all of that quite well, it kind of settled me in and it kind of got me prepared for what to expect uh, on all avenues of performing stand-up. Granted, I didn't want to do Taxi. By the end of 1999, I had taken the stage for the very first time in my life, and it took me a while, but that was my career. I turned something that was a dream that really only was born in 1999. Everything that has to do with it is my love of movies and, and how I fell for what how movies make me feel, and I turned it into something that, that I wanted and something that I wanted to make others feel through my ability to make others laugh. No matter how important a year 1999 was for film, that is why 1999 was the most important year for me. I want to thank so many different people for taking part in this. The, the submissions were fantastic. I cannot thank you enough. All of you who have pressed and pressed and pressed and tried to will this series along, it, it, it means the world to me. We're probably going to tuck this idea away for a little bit. Uh, I'd like a little bit more attention to do something like this again in the future, but you were here. Those of you who had a good time, you were here. Uh, I hear you, I know you, and thank you. Thank you so, so much. Don't rule out movies. You never know what a movie could drive you to do. Uh, I'm walking, talking proof. My all-time favorite would have to be be prepared to stop. <laughs> Shouldn't we always be prepared to stop? But should there be be prepared to turn, be prepared to accelerate? Dude, you just hit a pedestrian. I wasn't prepared to stop. Did you see a sign? I didn't see a sign.